lots of experts saying that there's absolutely no point whatsoever in uh, vaccinating 16 and 17 year olds. Uh, yet the government seems uh, determined uh, to jab 1.4 million teenagers with the Pfizer uh, vaccine. Uh, do you approve of that? Is it a good idea? Well, it seems yet another U-turn from the government, doesn't it? Every day is lucky dip policy day. You know, you wake up and you don't know quite what they're going to say next. And what I'd like to know is if you remember three weeks ago, the JCVI was very worried about the side effects, particularly inflammation of the heart. So myocarditis and pericarditis. And I'd like to know what exactly has changed in those three weeks that now makes them think that they can vaccinate young people as young as 16 and 17. And I think what was really interesting from the press conference was that they really didn't hide very much. They said, and they pretty much said, this was about protecting your parents and your grandparents, not protecting you as a 16 or 17 year old. And I have a major problem with that. The whole point of immunization should be to protect the individual. And I've said this to you before, that the first rule of medicine is do no harm. And I am very worried about these drugs that have been licensed under emergency legislation that we were rolling out for the, if you remember the elderly and the vulnerable, then the over 50, suddenly they changed the rules again, then the over 40s, then we got down as low as 18 and now 16 and 17 year olds as well. Let's make this really clear. Young people of 16 and 17 may well get COVID, of course they may, but they don't tend to become ill and they recover and they get immunity as a result. And we know what's gonna happen at the end of this, don't we? It's gonna roll down to 12 year olds. And the biggest worry I have of the whole thing is that the 16 and 17 year olds don't even need parental consent to have these vaccines. So uh, I wanna to stress to the listeners that we, we need to listen to you. Uh, you're not just a politician uh, shooting in the dark. You're a medically qualified doctor. So you know what you're talking about well, here. Yeah, uh, what, and, and why, look, why I, I'm David? not anti-vaccine at all I know you, in I know any you're sense. Not. I know yeah, you're... I've had both mine, you know, I'm 52. So therefore it's right that I have both vaccines. What I'm worried about is these, the adverse side effects that are being reported through the yellow card system. And when you look at all of these thousands of reports of neurological problems, of, re of reproductive problems, of bleeding, of breast disorders, I just think we need to stop and look at the long-term data. And I just don't think we've had enough time to assess all of the safety data. And so in terms of the possibility, the distinct possibility uh, that uh, we're definitely it looks like we're definitely get 16 and 17 year olds having to have the jab. Uh, but they are talking about going as low as 12 year, 12 years old. Uh, what possible use uh, or purpose is there in that? Well, I think the whole point, I, I honestly don't know what the government's playing at. I'm, obviously, they're following other European countries that, that are going down this route. But the point I have is, I'm not sure I would want my nephews and nieces, and I have five of them of that sort of age, to have the vaccine. I don't want them having something that we have no long-term studies on. I also don't believe we should be vaccinating children if the risk from the disease is less than the potential risk of the immunisation. So for me, that makes no sense at all. We don't know what happens in terms of reproductive capability later on. We don't know what's going to happen to these children as, as they grow older. And I just don't see the sense in vaccinating children as young as 12. I'd rather they got COVID. And also, if you look at 93% of the British public, according to ONS, now have antibodies against COVID. So the point is, we've vaccinated the older people, we've vaccinated the vulnerable and the elderly. So if the vaccines are working, which they are, why do we need to vaccinate younger people? It makes no sense to me. So we've hit 93%. I know we were at 87% last week and closing in fast. Now, uh, all the experts say that 93% is officially herd immunity. So why do we need all these measures? Well, that's a very good question. And that's the point that I'm putting to you. And I think the point is that government, I think, has become very power crazed by this, that we need to open up the economy. We need to let people to get back to normal. And I think the whole the problem is that actually we've become so fixated by one particular virus, by COVID. We've lost sight of everything else. We're going to see a horrible rebound of many other viral infections this year, mark my word. Influenza is going to be a big problem because, of course, we haven't seen anyone. So, of course, there's been no close contact with, with people carrying different viruses. So I'm very worried that not only have we become a COVID-only service in terms of viruses, but as you and I have talked about, we've got four to six million people waiting for elective procedures. I honestly think, talking to my friends and colleagues in the NHS, the NHS will never catch up from this crisis. 
Yes, yeah, so, there's a 5.3 million backlog. 5.3 million people trapped in the waiting list from hell. And as you quite rightly say, all this talk of, oh, uh, we're going to have to start working on that. That is an insoluble waiting list. They will never, ever get round to getting rid of that, will they? No, I don't think they will. And I think you need radical reform. And that's one of the things that we're very passionate about in, in the political party in Reform UK is actually to say, why are there waiting lists and what can we do about it? The two major parties, the Conservatives and Labour, just sort of pay homage to it and say we're going to fund it more. But that isn't the fundamental way that we will reform the NHS. You've got to remember it was set up in 1948 in a very different time when it didn't offer the plethora of services that it now does. So we need to think smarter, we need to be clever about what we do, but ultimately the NHS will need a lot of reform. And we don't actually know as individuals how much we're paying for it. And we also don't know what to expect. I don't think it's realistic for the government to say, you can expect all of the treatment for free. I don't think that's possible going forward. And I think we have to have a very serious conversation with the public about what services do you want the NHS to provide and how much are you willing to pay for it? Now, a little personal story. I'm incredibly excited. I'm going to go and watch my team, Fulham, uh, on Sunday uh, for the first time live at the ground uh, for two seasons because, of course, last season unfolded basically in camera with no one able to attend uh, the grounds. Now, I can go this Saturday. I can go for the uh, next couple of months. But according to the government, come October the 1st, mm. I'll require proof of two vaccines, double jab. I'll, I'll require a vaccine passport to get into to the ground. I mean, uh, we could talk about the weirdness of that. What? It, how, how? What? How possibly can I be allowed to go for two months and then suddenly I need a vaccine passport? Well, of course, uh, it, but, makes no, but, it makes no sense, does it? It That's does. It point. doesn't. But my point again to come back to the herd immunity point, David, is if we we've, we've reached herd immunity, or if not, we're very very close. Uh, why do I need a vaccine passport in October? Why do we need any measures? Doesn't herd immunity mean, to all intents and purposes, as a population, we've defeated COVID? It cannot harm us anymore. Yeah, I'm totally against vaccine passports. I think it creates a division of those who have had the vaccine and those who haven't. And, and the irony of this is the government has spent the whole of today saying, well, it's not compulsory to have the vaccine. It's up to you whether you have the vaccine. But then at the same time, it's essentially forcing you to have the vaccine by saying you can't go to the football, you can't go to the rugby, you can't go to the pub, you can't go to a restaurant. That's not acceptable because that smacks to me of papers, please. And my biggest worry is what happens to this data. This is the beginning of and make no mistake of this, this is the beginning of your health data being used and being sold, being sold to big pharma and big health industries to ensure that they have the data on you and they can target you. And I don't like it. I'm against centralised systems. I think it's fine to have a patient health database of your particular complaints and the medications you're on, but I'm deeply against centrally held medical records. I'm told by my uh, political journalist colleagues in Westminster uh, that senior Tories are briefing uh, when they say, well, if we've got herd immunity, why do we need vaccine passports? Why do we need to carry on with the vaccine programme? In fact, why do we need any, any measures at all? Uh, and uh, they are being told, well, you are making the mistake of looking at this through the prism of a health crisis. Uh, this uh, decreasingly has got anything to do with COVID. It is to do with a government that has tasted almost ultimate power for the last 18 months, is kind of drunk on it and doesn't want to let go of it. I, I couldn't agree more. I think I said to you when I was, um, you know, I had my vaccines and I went abroad and I was going to say the reason that you're going to have to have a vaccine passport is if you want to have a foreign holiday. I mean, I think that, you know, the airlines have made that very clear. The other countries have made that very clear. And if you look at the, the shambolic mess of, of all the countries and those lists, the green, the amber watch, the uh, green watch, the amber plus, you know, there are more colours than Joseph had on his coat. It's ridiculous. It's got to stop. But um, what I was going to say um, in terms of uh, where, sorry, I've just lost the plot there. <laughs> in terms of um, the, the passports themselves, what just worries me about that is it just is not very libertarian. And when I flew back from uh, Spain, I got pinged by track and trace, as I told you. I know, yes. And, and it felt incredibly uh, dictatorial, actually. The fact that people banged on my door and actually worked, wanted to know whether I was still at home, I felt was an invasion of my privacy. And it was 
fundamentally un-British. I totally agree. And uh, by the way, uh, David, on August the 16th, uh, when those who have been double jabbed, uh, if they get pinged, will not have to self-isolate, and those who get pinged who have not uh, been double jabbed uh, will have to self isolate there you got it that's when Britain becomes a divided society and if we carry on down this road uh, with vaccine passports for football uh, and nightclubs etc we're going to become a more and more divided society those who have the vaccine passport and who have been double jabbed are kind of superior citizens and those who haven't second class citizens that's not what we want is it well, I and what's next? What other health data do they want to encode? You know, it's a very slippery slope into encoding other medical conditions. You know, are you going to have to prove that you haven't had certain other conditions, for example? Do they want to know whether you've got a bloodborne condition? I'm just deeply worried about where this goes in the totalitarian state. And I think you're right, the government is drunk on the power. They don't know that they have to stop. And unfortunately, they've done such a brilliant job scaring everyone witless that the majority of people are compliant still. Although I'm beginning to see people taking masks off in supermarkets. I was on the tube yesterday uh, and people were not wearing masks on the tube. And actually, I think that the time has come for the people to rebel and the people to say, look, we've reached herd immunity. We've had our vaccines. We've done what the government asked. It's now time to get back to normal. Can you, uh, from a medical standpoint, uh, David, explain exactly what herd immunity is? Uh, uh, from my uh, naive, uh, ill-informed point of view, I thought that was the point where you've defeated the virus because so many people have had it or they've been vaccinated uh, that it cannot in any way continue to kill people and cases uh, cannot increase anymore. So can you uh, enlighten us uh, from a more informed point of view? What well, is herd immunity? Well, we will always have the, the virus will always be with us. And as you know, it will always mutate. So you get antigenic drift and antigenic shift. The idea between behind herd immunity is when you get that high level of the population that are immune to that virus, the virus has no host. So therefore, the virus will find it very difficult to settle and to infect people. So it becomes harder and harder for that virus. And essentially, you're right in layman's terms, you have defeated the virus. Now, there will always be some people where the virus, as it mutates, will then infect other people. But we have to learn to live with those mutations. And all the data shows that both of the main vaccines, in fact, all of the vaccines, are incredibly good at defeating these variants. So the point is that actually, I do believe that we're over the worst of this, that people have been incredibly compliant and we need to move on. And the politicians have got to realize that they have overstepped the boundaries and they have overstepped their power. And if we have reached herd immunity, as I say, I know for a fact it was 87% of the population had antibodies last week. Uh, you say now we've, uh, and the 93% is the magic number. You say we've reached that. So the ONS says 93 today. Yeah. So 93, oh, I didn't realise that. So we've reached it, herd immunity. So <laughs> uh, what, uh, sorry to keep labouring this question. Why then <laughs> is the government talking about measures that go into the winter and beyond? What on earth is going on? Well, I think that's the, the thing that I don't really understand, you know, and I keep going back to first principles. Either the vaccines work or they don't work. And if they don't work, why are we giving them? And if, we, if they do work, why are we imposing all these measures? And no one can answer those questions for me. And the point is that as far as I can see from all the data, the vaccines do work and the rollout has been incredibly successful. And we're now moving into a next phase of saying we're going to give a third vaccine. Well, what, what comes next after all of that? And so I, I do think that... That, that essentially they have become victims of their own success, that I think government is listening far too closely to worrying scientists. And remember that the whole point about being a medic is it's, it's an art and a science. You have to balance up scientific fat and then you have to make decisions based on clinical need. And I think at the moment, people are listening far too closely to some of these eminent scientists. And you know, look, life is full of risk. And we have to take some risks because the mental health crisis that's unfolding in this country is going to be enormous unless we let people get back to having normal lives.